Sound speed. Marker. Action. Check, check. Check one, two. Son of a Sound speed. Action. <sighs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching True Audio Live. This is Thomas Pop. I want to say thank you for joining us today. We have a great show for you. Today, we're all about Sure Axiant Digital Wireless. And I've got some good friends with me today. I'd like to introduce you if you don't know them, but you probably should. Whit Norris and Kevin Surchai, how are you guys doing today? Good. Good. Awesome. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. You know, one of the reasons why I'm so excited to have you guys on is because you guys are working on some amazing shows that are maybe a little bit more complex than most people and when it comes to wireless, you know, in the past 15 to 20 years, there's been so many changes in the wireless spectrum and, and the ways that things transmit and, you know, the FCC giving away some of our frequencies, et cetera. What do you have to say about the challenges in the RF spectrum that we have? Um, in our market here, Kevin and I, uh, I want to say uh, when we went back to work in the fall or the end of the summer, um, I think the RF environment changed incredibly in Atlanta. Um, we, uh, we were running into more issues when we were in Midtown and Downtown. Uh, uh, one night we had had six wires working beautifully for, for many hours, and then something turns on at 2 a.m. that pretty much knocked us out. And it wasn't just us that were having problems. Other departments that were transmitting were having problems. You, you remember that night? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> multiple nights that's happened and, uh, you know, just having to go and make some changes quickly, try to figure out what's happening. Yeah, know? doing that that it's famous not, saying of damage not, control, you know, having to yeah. run around and, and fix all of the wireless when it's already set up, right? Yeah, yeah. set up and working beautifully until something happens. I mean, but we've also had challenges, you know, trying to find clear frequencies in certain blocks and of course, we uh, all of our blocks are legal, um, but it's it's become much more challenging. And even with some of the tools that we have, it's not been easy sometimes when you're trying to get you know six to ten wirelesses all uh, working uh, perfectly. Yeah, and that's why I'm glad that we're here today because we have a good friend from Shore. His name is Jason Walfel. Jason, how are you doing today? What's up, everybody? Doing very well. Thanks for having me, man. Happy to be here. Absolutely. And this guy right here, Jason, is not only a great pheasant hunter, we, we need to segue for a second here because you guys went on oh a vacation with Glenn this past weekend. Tell me a little bit about it before we get into this. Yeah, this was uh, this was out of the blue. Glenn, uh, Glenn kind of randomly asked if I would join. Uh, I believe you were there, Thomas, and uh, I was more than happy to oblige. Uh, made a trip down to just outside of Atlanta over the weekend um, and did a little bit of pheasant hunting with some some new friends, uh, which was a fantastic day. So thanks yeah, to all I, of I can say that Jason is a, is a pretty good shot. He did well. <laughs> That's amazing. And, 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 and Glenn True is, uh, is uh, very impressive. I was going to say, not quite as good as Glenn with that 100-plus-year-old uh, uh, side-by-side rifle he had. I had a pump, and I think he, he smoked me. So, uh, yeah. He, he wasn't missing much, that's for sure. No, no, he was not. No, he was not. That was a lot of fun with some of the Atlanta sound community. Absolutely. Well, we'll definitely have to make that an annual event for you guys. But let's definitely get back into the Sure Axient Wireless. And Jason, I know that you brought a commercial for Axient Digital to kind of get it kicked off. Do you want me to start with that? I did. That sounds great. This will kind of prime things up and, and give a nice overview, and then we'll dive into some of the details. Absolutely. That sounds good. All right, everyone, check out this commercial from Shure on Axient Digital Wireless. We'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Jen Liang Shabu from Shure. We're here in Soldier Field in downtown Chicago, working with the Axient Digital Wireless System. 
Around the world, the wireless spectrum is getting noisier and more congested. Chicago is no exception, as you can see in this spectrum scan. Today we are going to show you how Axient Digital can significantly increase your confidence to operate in a variety of applications and protect against dropouts and other issues, even in a venue of this size. All of the audio you hear is coming from these receivers. We'll use Wireless Workbench to monitor Axient Digital's channel quality meter, which monitors the RF signal to noise ratio. For our first challenge, we're going to go to my colleague, Chris Lyons, who is way up in the stands. Live events today are using more wireless channels than ever, while the amount of available spectrum continues to get smaller. I'm wearing an Axiant Digital body pack set to high density mode, which enables you to use up to 47 active transmitters on just one 6 MHz TV channel. And even though high density mode transmits with a power level of only 2 milliwatts, it's still more than enough to cover even a large venue like this. I'm more than 150 yards away and I'm still being picked up perfectly, even though the body pack is behind me without a clear line of sight to the receiver antennas. Thanks, Chris. So far, we've been using two antennas with true digital diversity. However, many productions have complex stage setups that involve more than one area of the venue. So for our second challenge, we're gonna move off the field and into the tunnels of the stadium. Quadversity mode allows you to attach two additional antennas to the quad receiver. We place two additional antennas at the front of the tunnel. Come follow me. The Axiant Digital Receiver intelligently monitors and digitally combines the signal from all four antennas. Quadversity can increase gain and signal stability across a single zone or extend the range into multiple zones, just like this concrete tunnel inside the stadium, where I am transmitting clean and clear audio. And now I'm going to send you to Michael Johns, the product manager for Axiant Digital. Operating wireless microphones is all about signal-to-noise ratio. We've designed a digital radio that requires less signal-to-noise in order to operate. As a result, Axion Digital provides signal stability in a way that no other system can. I'm currently transmitting from this handheld at 10 milliwatts to our A and B antennas. For our last challenge, we've identified a noisy frequency and tuned this handheld to transmit directly on top of it. As you can see from the spectrum analyzer, there's a high potential for interference. However, Axient Digital is still receiving my signal perfectly. I am standing on the other side of the stadium in the middle of downtown Chicago, operating on top of a noisy frequency and still passing flawless digital audio. Now that's integrity you can hear. What an amazing commercial from Shure. God, the, the entire arena was completely covered with Shure Axient Digital. Jason, this is amazing. Kudos to your team for this one. Thank you. Yeah, that one makes its rounds quite a bit, and a lot of people uh, enjoy that commercial a, a lot. So kudos to them. I wasn't, I wasn't involved with that, but uh, Jen and Chris and MJ and the video team, you guys did great. Um, yeah, so that's that's just kind of a really good example of the capabilities of Sure Axiom Digital and what it can do. Um, there's a lot of information in that video that I think we're going to break down a little bit today, uh, hopefully, and, and give a better overview of the ecosystem that is Axiom Digital and all the components that come with it and why uh, why we think it makes sense for for film and TV and and a little bit of why Wit, uh, Wit and Kevin have um, adopted it and, and uh, seen the light, I suppose. So thank, thank you, Wit and Kevin, for being here. Um, thanks. Yeah, man, absolutely. We appreciate it. Uh, it, you know, at this point, I think I was just kind of run through kind of some of the, uh, components of sure Axient digital talk about what pieces and parts you need to make a system work, um, just from, from the base up. Uh, if there's any questions or anything while we're, while we're going through this, um, feel free to fire those away. I believe Thomas is going to jump in and feed those to us as they come through. Uh, I'm watching the chat, everyone. Thomas. 
give us your questions. Yeah. Fire it up. I'm more than off more than likely we'll we'll cover it as we get through, but I'm happy to jump around as as our audience as our audience requires. So and thank you to you guys for for showing up and joining and and watching. Um, uh, we, you know, it doesn't matter if we do this if nobody comes. So we appreciate you being here. So, without further ado, um, Axiom Digital. Axiom Digital is uh, fairly new, not super new, but very new to the film and TV market. Uh, digital ecosystem um, for wireless audio. Uh, it's got three main bands in the U.S. that we offer. Uh, the most common that you're going to hear of is G57 um, or G57 Plus, which is essentially the entire UHF spectrum space. So you're looking at 470 to 608, uh, and then that plus gets you the 614 to 617 band. So essentially, um, there are no uh, no more, you know, we had L's and G's and H in terms of like bandwidth lockouts for transmitters and receivers. If you get a G57 transmitter and a G57 receiver, you get 470 to 608 plus the 614 to 617 gap. So hyper wideband, tons of real estate, um, you know, pretty much everything that's legal. Uh, after that, the other two bands that I mentioned is K56, which is just the duplex, duplex gap and guard band. So that's 614 to 617. And then that little sliver is 653 to 663. Um, so if you are super challenged and you need some of that duplex gap, we offer that. And then X55, which is our STL band. So that's going to be 941 to 960. Um, but most people live in that G57 world, which is that massive spectrum of real estate, 470 to 608 plus. Uh, there are two types of receivers. Uh, we offer a quad and a dual rack mount receiver at this time. So you'll see the 84Q there. Um, thank you for pulling that up. Appreciate it. Uh, on the back of the 84Q, uh, we're going to run through this left to right. You've got uh, AC there on the left, and that is a DC option that you can see pulled up there. Um, after that, there's a four-port audio switch um, or four-port Ethernet switch, excuse me. Um, this can be configured in two ways, uh, switched or split. Basically, it gives you a true four-port switch that's fully switched, or you can split it up into three different networks, being control, Dante primary, and Dante secondary. Uh, so yes, there is Dante native in this receiver. It does have a primary and a secondary card. And then control being how you get into some of our software uh, for uh, remote control via Workbench or our iPad, iPhone app, which is called Channels. Um, after that, you've got some word clock inputs um, and then your four channels of input. So XLR, tip ring sleeve, uh, audio outputs, and we also offer AES directly out of the back. Um, so four ways to get audio out, Dante, AES, TRS, and XLR. Um, on the far right, you'll notice there's your two audio inputs being AB and then a cascade output being CD. Uh, and then there's this cool feature called Quadversity, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, so those are the receiver offerings right now. Hopefully I'm not firing off too much information too fast. Uh, but uh, I think we got a lot to cover here. There's the dual. That's the 84D, D for dual. Uh, the only difference between the dual and the quad is the quad has to leverage um, output XLR outputs uh, three and four, I believe, for the AES, where the dual will have a dedicated AES output. And that's just a lack of real estate from, from having enough ports on the back to give you dedicated AES outputs or not. Um, other than that, they are exactly the same. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of features you get with the receivers themselves that we're going to dive into a little bit later, but, um, all of Axiom Digital is AES 256 bit encrypted, um, which I believe is an industry leader. Uh, there's transmitter authentication, which is a new feature basically says, Hey, if you haven't, um, authenticated this transmitter, uh, we're not going to open the audio gate. So, uh, you got to go, th go through a sync function to say, Hey, this is a transmitter I want. And if it's not your transmitter, you're going to get no audio out of it. So no, no weird artifacts of interference events. Um, and then the Q meter, which is pretty important in digital, um, digital transmission or digital audio, uh, Q meter is a quality meter. It's an index found on most manufacturers, digital, uh, wireless. This is basically a link quality indicator that tells you, um, what the quality of the packet loss and packet reception is between transmitter and receiver. So for a long time, we lived on RSSI or received signal strength indicators to tell us what RF looked like and where we are at the noise floor. Uh, and now kind of in the digital domain, we want to pay attention to our Q meter a little bit more. And it's a more better representation of, of what the quality of our signal is. 
uh, almost regardless of RSSI in some situations. You can have a very low RSSI and still have a Q5 in the digital domain. Um, and that's one of the big advantages to a true digital uh, system is how close it can live to the noise floor and how close it can live to some other interfering uh, carrier signals um, and still have a Q5 because it basically just doesn't look at any of that noise. Um, so that's uh, Axiom Digital Receiver and, um, and some of its uh, features. The next thing that I'd like to talk about, unless there's any immediate questions or Witt or Kevin, you've got anything to, to jump in here with, um, would be the transmitter suite. You know, the biggest thing that somebody's already asking is if there is a portable receiver option. So we might as well just throw that out early. That didn't take long. No, it didn't. Oh, I, did it. I had a clock on how long that was going to take. That's fantastic. Kudos to you, whoever uh, threw that in there. Um, sure is always working on new and exciting things. Um, so, uh, you know, we're very aware that uh, for the film and TV market, that's that's a must have. Um, and so sure is always working on new and exciting stuff. So. I would just, I just have to say, stay tuned uh, to get an answer on that. Can I throw in one more question? Because we just got another one. And if, you, if you guys don't mind me yeah, doing this from time away. to time. It says, my question is about HD mode. Can you run, say, 100 Sure ULXD in HD mode, 2 milliwatt, in some breakout rooms? While next door, in the general session, you run 40 Axiant Digital in regular mode, 10, millil 10 watt and up. I assume, um, do you understand that question? I do. I absolutely do. Uh, and, and, and it's a great question. It's, it's circumstantial, to be honest with you, in terms of how many channels you can get in one space. I don't know the noise floor. I don't know the DTV. Um, so in, in theory, that channel count doesn't sound undoable um, at, in, in HD mode. Um, and for those of you that don't know what HD mode is, um, HD mode is a way that we increase our spectral efficiency in both ULXD and Axiant Digital. It doesn't stand for HD high definition. It stands for HD high density. Um, so out of the box, ULXD and Axiom Digital come in SD mode, which is standard density. Um, and then you have the option to place these units into what's called HD or high density mode. Um, and essentially, uh, you go from 17 channels in 6 megahertz in standard density is what, is what we spec um, at how many transmitters you can get in a six megahertz or single TV channel space, um, which is 17. And then uh, in HD or high density mode, you, you, you boost that up to 47 transmitters in one six megahertz TV space. Um, and the trade-offs there are twofold. One being power output. Um, so you're going to lower your output power on all your transmitters. Uh, and the second is latency. You, you add one millisecond of latency to your audio. So you go from... Uh, 1.9 milliseconds of latency on Axiom Digital to 2.9 milliseconds of latency when you go to HD mode. Um, and in your world, that's not as relevant as it is in, in maybe some live aspects, but still 2.9 is incredibly low. Um, so that's that's high density mode. Um, I have a couple graphics of that. If you want me to screen share, I can, um, if we want to spend some more time on that. In, in regards to the specific question, at that channel count, um, it, it might be required to put Axiom Digital in high density mode, being 40 transmitters next door. Um, I'd be happy to assist in a coordination if somebody, if that's a real scenario that you're you're up against right now. Um, please reach out to myself. Uh, I can put my email in the chat or have Thomas or whoever it is, uh, and I'll be more than willing to help you um, coordinate that through Workbench. I got, I told him to contact us after. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You got it. Um, it's it seems entirely doable. Uh, I don't want to say yes, but it's not out of the scope of reality to get that many channels on the air between ULXD and Axiom Digital in high density mode. So why don't we get back to transmitters? Wit, Kevin, which transmitters did you guys go for? Uh, we ended up getting. I think we're going for the ADX ones. We got. I think twelve. We ordered. And then, um, I'm sorry, the ADX one M, twelve of those, yeah. and then yeah, five of the ADX ones. What was the reasoning for uh, the different styles? Why'd you pick them? Can you tell me a little bit about them and and you know your your process of uh, acquiring this? Oh, let me go ahead. Okay, um, so the ADX one M, they're mini transmitters so those will fit well with most of our actors and actresses uh we'll use the adx ones for talkbacks where um 
between me and Wit and whoever our utility is. Um, we just don't need the smaller unit. We could just go with the regular size unit for that. And also uh, for plant mics. Yeah. Also, yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, Jason, why don't we start talking about all of the other liners? Because those aren't the only ones that they have. You guys actually have a lot that work with uh, the Axiant lineup. Do you want to just run down all of them? Yeah, the, the transmitter suite's pretty extensive for Axiant Digital, uh, especially as of as of late with uh, our partnership with a company called Quantum or Q5X. But yeah, first off, the ADX1M or Micro, uh, which you, you, know, you had pulled up there. Um, this unit's got four internal antennas. Uh, you'll notice there's no external antenna there at all. Um, and you know what? Before I start, I think I'd like to do some clarification in our transmitter suite. And that is anything that is has an X in its title, ADX1, ADX1M, uh, means that it's ShowLink capable. And ShowLink is our system to remote control um, all of the transmitters remotely via the front panel or through Workbench. Um, if it does not have an X in the title, there's the show link. Fantastic. Um, so that's our that's our uh, 2.4 or Zigbee controlled back channel communication device that allows you to remote control transmitters. If it doesn't have an X in the title, it's not show link capable. So Axiant Digital is very much choose your own adventure and very scalable. Um, and it all kind of starts around the receivers, uh, and then you can scale up or scale down between your transmitters uh, from price point and need basis, as well as some of the accessories like the show link that was just shown and the spectrum manager um, as well, which is what, what kind of manages the, the spectrum for you automatically. Um, so back to transmitters, ADX1M, which is the micro body pack that is remote controllable. ADX1, which is kind of our standard remote control body pack. That's more of the uh, form factor you're used to seeing with the external antenna. Um, and then we've got the ADX2, which is our uh, hand mic. Um, and then there's something called the ADX2FD. The FD stands for frequency diversity. Um, and this basically essentially means that that hand mic is transmitting on two frequencies at one time. Um, simultaneously, which uh, essentially means that if it were to be interrupted on frequency one, frequency two would take over. Um, uh, one, one thing I wanted to jump in here, Jason, is uh, going back uh, to, um, going back to the uh, ADX1M, uh, the fact that it is waterproof. You want to talk about that? I think that's a big factor. That's something that we all deal with. Uh, not necessarily people going surfing with them, but there's accidents <laughs> happening and there's rain scenes and various things. And that the connector also makes it waterproof if you use the Limo connector, I believe is correct. Yeah, so you'll only be able to get the micro in Limo, and that's part of the reason because of the, the waterproof connectivity of the Limo connector being screw on. Um, and you'll notice that on these photos, um, uh, it's a it's kind of a polymer housing um, that is designed. We don't we don't say waterproof. We say sweat sweat and water resistant. Um, you know, I like you mentioned. I wouldn't go surfing with it, but uh, if it were to get pretty heavily sweated on and uh, maybe even dropped in a bucket or a toilet, uh, it should be just fine. All the buttons on it are um, you know encased in kind of a, a rubber. There's no external button. You'll notice there's no charging ports. Um, on the back of this transmitter itself. Some of our other transmitters, you'll see charging contacts. There's a great shot of the buttons on the top that are kind of a rubber rubber housing, um, if you will. Um, so yeah, it is. it was designed to be exceptionally sweat proof and very water resistant. Um, and that, uh, that definitely has a part on why it's Limo only, uh, also size. Um, and so you'll see the rounded edges. It's very soft. It's got nothing that's going to poke anybody. Um, if you rub it on your skin, it, it, it has no, no ill effects to wearing on the body. Uh, and it was definitely designed with that in mind. Um, and again, no external antenna. So yeah, there's a great size reference in front of the rack, uh, in terms of, you know, having it in your hand. So we see a lot of this in theater application. Yep. There's the ADX one, which is the next ADX transmitter. A lot of it in theater, and we're starting to see a lot of it in film and TV uh, being adopted because of the size, the comfort, and the fact that, you know, if you're in a rain scene or if you've got somebody, you stuff that in a wig and they sweat on it and you cover it in hairspray, it's going to be fine. Um, one thing to note, great point there, anything with an X in it transmitter-wise 
is rechargeable only and it's proprietary only. So we make our own batteries for the ADX series, the Micro, the ADX1, the ADX2. Um, they are pretty fantastic in a sense that we put our own chip in there as well, which provides all kinds of telemetry data to you, temperature, cycles, overall health. Um, your battery readout on your receivers are going to be hours and minutes, not some kind of random bar segment. Um, so if you've got you know, 12 minutes left in a scene, your battery is going to tell you you've got 16 minutes left you know you're good to go, right? At the end of the day, it's going to give you a, a minute readout versus a one bar where you, you just have no idea what that means. Um, all the chargers that you're going to get for these components or these rechargeable batteries are networkable as well. Um, so you can read out all of your charging information remotely over the network um, that you have set up. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's our ADX and battery suite. Uh, we could move on to the next transmitters unless there's more topics or conversations here. I just want to bring up one thing you with got the, it. the transmitter. Um, just with actors and actresses, I just want to go over with the buttons, you know, that those can be locked because that yep. was a concern that I yep. originally had. And, uh, you know, we know that can be remotely locked. And in great fact, point. you know what, Jason, could you uh, talk a little bit more about the buttons? We have someone asking a question, what is the reasoning to not include gain or sensitivity controls on the pack? And is there any individual transmitter gain sensitivity channel control on the receiver? This is a great question. Um, so there is no gain or sensitivity on the, on the belt pack because there is essentially um, a, a, about 140 dB of dynamic range built into the modulation scheme of Axiom Digital. What that means is you're going to over-modulate any microphone element you put long before you over-modulate the, the modulation scheme that's converting this A to D and sending it over the air. Um, so uh, essentially Axiom Digital is doing some auto-gaining for you from whisper and loud uh, to get that output within a certain range so that it hits your mixer um, relatively at the same level. Um, and I know that's maybe scary and unheard of in your world, uh, but I would urge you to uh, listen to it and try it before you judge it. Uh, it is very well received among everyone that uses it. There is some things called mic offset if you get into the menu of audio on our transmitters and polarity. Um, and the mic offset really has to do if you're double miking a source with two different elements that have a, a very different sensitivity or input, you would be able to mic offset the, uh, and to get those to be more level or to be more the same. Um, other than that, on the front of the receiver, uh, if you want to pull up my screen share of the equipment, um, you'll be able to see that if I go into device audio, um, excuse me, if I go into channel, Um, you'll be able to see kind of a system gain menu that shows up here. Uh, and there is a mic offset, there is a receiver gain, and then there's some fixed gain between your outputs. And then it will give you kind of a net gain output there. Um, so there is receiver gain. Essentially, you're going to want to get this set um, nominal across the board, and then you should never have to touch it. Your input uh, with that much modulation and that much um, separation in input dB uh, should just automatically give you the sound that you need. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people that use it forget about gain settings uh, quickly after setting it up. So we can get you some more detailed information on that. If you're looking for specifics, um, reach out to myself or Thomas and we can follow up on exactly what those meters are meaning and, and how that, that system's set up. But that's kind of the gist of it. And I think that you started to touch on the digital controls. There's another question talking about the digital control that you have over these transmitters. Can you kind of go into that a little bit more? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming remote control is what we're talking about here. Correct. Uh, exactly. Digital control, remote control. Yeah. Um, so anything that, like I mentioned, that has an X in the name transmitter wise has a, uh, an additional antenna built into the transmitter that is internal. So on the ADX one M there, there's four internal antennas, um, on the hand mic, there's one at the bottom. And on that ADX one, we saw just the UHF antenna out of the top. The back channel receive happens um, over essentially 2.4 spectrum. It's somewhat Zigbee protocol. Um, and you're getting roughly 300 feet line of sight distance on this in a proper noise floor environment. Um, and essentially every single parameter that you can change on an ADX transmitter is remote controllable from the front panel of your rack from wireless workbench and vice versa. So if you change something on a transmitter, it's going to send that back over the network and that will indeed change at the rack. 
Um, so there are no parameters. There are not remote controllable. Everything you can program on the front of a belt pack, you can control from Workbench or from the front panel of the receiver, one of the two, uh, including RF mute, power lock, gain, um, um, anything you could, a frequency, right? This is the number one thing. So if you want to remotely change your frequency, you can do that with the proper equipment including the spectrum manager that you're seeing in my screen share here, which is below the receiver. That unit coupled with the show link, which we saw uh, not too long ago, the small Zigbee remote control unit, um, will automatically change your frequency in an interference event um, in about 90 milliseconds. Um, so if we want to go through that whole process, we can do that um, in terms of how that functions. It sounds like we should. Um, and so essentially the spectrum manager is going to do a scan um, and create a list of frequencies that you're using and then a list of backup frequencies. The spectrum manager's job is to constantly monitor those backup frequencies and put them in order of best to worst. So they're looking at RSSI um, and it's monitoring that without you knowing it and creating a backup list. In the event that one of your current frequencies um, gets an interference event uh, for whatever reason, like Whit was mentioning one night at one in the morning, a bunch of his channels just went haywire, um, that spectrum manager would go, hey, I've got somewhere for you to move. Um, and your receiver's going to talk to the show link and say, hey, do you have good connectivity with my body pack? And they're going to say yes if they're in show link distance. Uh, and that sh that spectrum manager is going to send a new frequency to both the transmitter and the receiver. They'll both switch, and it takes roughly 90 milliseconds for that to happen um, for you to get a new frequency. In audible terms, if someone's holding an audible note and singing, um, you're probably going to hear that drop. In speaking word, uh, it's unlikely that you're going to hear that, and if they do, it's a half a syllable or so of an actual audible dropout when that occurs. So that is automatic frequency avoidance and detection. Um, uh, that requires the spectrum manager, as I mentioned, which is the AXT600 unit that you're seeing in the screen share here. Um, and then the AD610 is the show link. Um, and the show link is what allows you remote control. So if you don't have the spectrum manager, but you do have the show link, you can ma uh, manually remote control all of your transmitters. Um, so if you were to get an interference event, you would have to go in and manually select change frequency, and then it would do that. Um, if you have the spectrum manager, that's kind of the unit that is automatically managing those frequencies for you in the background uh, and will ship those changes automatically based on uh, the thresholds that you can set and change. Um, so you can set the amplitude um, at which an interference event is destructive enough for it to actually set a change. All of these things are customizable within Workbench or the front panels uh, of any of these units. Where can people go ahead and get uh, a copy of that Sure Wireless Workbench? Is that free for everyone? It is. Our software is 100% free. So you can go to Wireless Workbench uh, from our web website. Um, he's got it pulled up right there. Thank you very much. It's a free download. You can get the software there. Wireless Workbench has an absurd amount of tools inside of it. We could spend the better part of an hour or more just going over Wireless Workbench. Um, its three main components are inventory tracking. So... Essentially, you can build your entire inventory remotely in your hotel room the night before you show up on set. You can create virtual devices. You can name them. You can number them. Um, you can add your entire rack without being at your rack. Um, you can then frequency coordinate in the second main portion of Wireless Workbench. It's a full coordination software. It accounts for thirds, fifths, intermods, DTV, zip code input for wherever you're going to be to get uh, TV database uh, exclusion and inclusion groups. Um, as, as far down the rabbit hole as you want to go from a frequency coordination standpoint, all those tools are there. It will ingest a scan from the spectrum manager or any one of your receivers. Um, so if you need an RF scan to do your coordination, you can do that. If you're connected to Workbench, Workbench will ingest a scan from one of the radios in one of your rack units, um, and that will allow you to uh, frequency coordinate based on a live scan. Uh, and then monitoring. So there's a full monitor page as well um, that will allow you to, uh, I guess I can I can screen share my workbench if you'd like, if we want to spend some time here. Um, yeah, let's do it. And in fact, we do have another question too. Someone's asking about control of the Axion system with like a mobile device. Like, is there an app in the app store for like Sure software? 
Great question. Um, there is an app for mobile devices. It's called Channels Plus. It's also free. Um, and uh, it's like Workbench Lite. So you can't do coordination, um, but you can monitor everything that you're seeing in Wireless Workbench from the Channels app. Um, and uh, if you have a full show link setup, you, you also can make changes there as well to your show link setup. So uh, Channels Plus, it's iPhone and iOS. And I believe the Android just got released if we're not still in beta. So it's very close if it's not released um, uh, in the next couple of weeks, I would imagine. Uh, I know the beta was out. I'm trying to remember if we launched the actual um, Android version for channels or not. But if not, it's coming very shortly. Uh, so if you have an iPad or an iPhone, um, you'll have to set up a local Wi-Fi network uh, on your antenna rig and may probably your cart as well uh, to create uh, a Wi-Fi network for you to connect your device to. Um, and then you get uh, you get the Channels Channels Plus app, which is monitoring and control, assuming you have show link capabilities. It doesn't have frequency coordination built into that app. That's kind of a workbench only function. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it looks like we're looking at my workbench software here. Um, I mentioned kind of three components. The first one's this inventory tab. Uh, the second one is frequency coordination, and the third one is monitor. Um, so if we were to go to my inventory tab, you'll notice this is live connected to my rack. I don't know if you can pull up the, the rack as well on the bottom here. Uh, might be beneficial to do so. But like if I select channel one here and I title this, excuse me. Uh-oh, got a little lag here from the screen share. Cool. If I title this Jason and I hit enter, you should be able to see that um, swap right over to the rack. Let's try this. Seems to be a network error from all this sharing. Obviously, we have a lot of interconnection between, if everyone right. knows, we're actually doing this live stream from Los Angeles, Nashville, and Atlanta, which is three of the locations that True Audio has. Uh, so if you guys are ever interested in picking up any of this short Axiom digital, please contact us. Our right. sales representatives are standing by. There we go. So it looked like channel one did, in fact, change. It's normally much quicker than this. Um, but if I do channel two, let's see if that's going to push through here. Yeah. Um, so basically you can name program, edit everything about your rack inside this inventory page. If you're connected at the time, it's going to, it's going to update that rack instantaneously. If you wanted to build this whole show in your hotel room the night before or on the flight to the rig, you could do that. You can just add virtual devices, name everything, program everything. Once you get there, plug your ethernet cable in and, and hit upload and your whole show is going to upload. Wait, um, wait, when you heard that feature of Sure Axient Wireless, how did that make you feel like that to be able to do all of the work that we're rushed to do in the beginning when we get to set literally even the day before? Um, I, that was one of the features uh, that caused us uh, to go through this um, was being able to to be able to scan and load it up. Um, but uh, doing it, you know, if you can do it beforehand, that's great. We don't always have that opportunity, but uh, but it's part of it's become part of every 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 day. Everybody has to scan when you get to a new location or a new stage, um, and and you know when you have twelve to fifteen transmitters that you have to go and change the frequency on every single one of them. It's very time consuming in the morning, Kevin. I, I want to say sometimes we spend twenty. 20 minutes, 20 minutes trying to do that when um, this is less than five minutes, more than likely. Would that be a correct, uh, Jason? Yeah, uh, I can I can do a whole I can go through the whole process here for this rack right in front of me uh, in in a matter of minutes here. And we can just kind of show that how that works. But yeah, essentially, you can take a scan, do a coordination and deploy it to your your rack in really less than three minutes. I mean, it's it's pretty fast if you trust the process. Um, and and one of the big things here that we're, I don't think has been conveyed properly yet is once you sync a transmitter to a channel, um, as you can see here on the front, I've got something synced to channel one and channel two of my rack. Um, 
once you sync it to that channel, it's locked to whatever information happens there uh, when you make changes. So what that means is if you show up with a rack of 16, uh, 16 channels, right, and you've got 16 transmitters, and you need to do a complete re-coordination first thing in the morning, um, once you go into Workbench or go to the front of your rack and you do that, which, like I said, takes a matter of minutes, um, all of your transmitters are going to update automatically over ShowLink. Uh, which means essentially you never have to resync a transmitter again. If you've got 16 mics and they're always going to be one through 16 in your kit, and that's never going to change, you will never have to resync one of those body packs. Um, you lay them out on the table, leave them in the case, uh, and if they're off, like even if they're turned off, when you turn it on, that transmitter is going to go, "Hey, where am I supposed to be?" Shilling's going to go, "Oh, we moved you to 572, 72, and it's going to change. Um, so you can do all of this offline. It will happen live if everything's powered on. It will happen when they get powered on uh, at, at that event, right? Um, so there's the show link. Yeah, the show link is, is uh, PoE powered. Um, so it takes an Ethernet connection. Um, as mentioned earlier, the back of the 84Q has a four port switch on it. Two of those ports has PoE power on it. It's designed to power a show link that way. Um, it will also work off a PoE uh, injector or a PoE a re remote PoE switch if you needed. Uh, additionally, if you have a very long Cat5 run to wherever you want to put your show link, there is a DC power option for the show link as well. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to make that show link function and get it to where you need it to make it work. Um, and then uh, mounting, there's a bunch of options for it as well. Uh, so yeah, if we want to screen share my workbench here, I'll run through a quick scan and coordination process uh, just to kind of show how easy this is. Um, and go ahead and pull up the front of the gear as well. Mm -hmm. Coming up right there. Um, and I've, I've got these two transmitters synced and I'm going to go ahead and turn them off just to kind of prove theory of what I was doing before. So those transmitters are, uh, that one's power locked. Give me a minute. That one's powered off. Um, cool. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to select my AXT 600 as my scan source. And I'm going to go ahead and scan with one source. What you're going to see is um, kind of eight radios that are inside the spectrum manager um, starting to scan my spectrum. Um, this is currently using antenna A to scan. Um, in a moment, you're going to see it use antenna B. Um, and this is the most time consuming process uh, of setting this system up if you're gonna if you're gonna take a scan currently getting this scan information um you know takes 90 seconds or so you're gonna see it pushed through here you'll notice this is wideband on the bottom you can see the numbers we're pushing 470 um up to the the high 870s there there's a little bit of a break where everything is illegal and then you get the stl band again um, at the top um, so now you can see it overlaying antenna b on top of the antenna a we're going to average out um, whatever those two mixes are, and that'll give us our current noise floor. You can see that I live in a remote location outside of Nashville where there's not a lot of DTV. Uh, so fairly, fairly easy coordination done here. Um, next thing I'm going to do is add whatever's in my inventory paddle. So we're going to go select frequencies from inventory, all, and hit OK. And this just brought in uh, my four channels of G57, Axiom Digital, and my two channels of PSM1000, IEM, and IFB. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hit calculate. I just calculated frequencies, and I'm going to hit assign and deploy. If you watch, uh, if you pull up the gear front, the front of the gear panel again, uh, I'm going to hit assign and deploy. I'm going to hit deploy to inventory, and you'll kind of see some lights go off, let you know, hey, I just made some changes here. You'll notice that my two transmitters were off when I did this, right? So let's assume that I just took them out of the, uh, out of the uh, case and turned them on. I just powered up channel one, and I'm going to power up channel two here in just a second. You'll see that the RF shows up immediately. I didn't have to resync those. Uh, I didn't have to do anything. They just went to the show link, said, oh, hey, look, you changed my frequency. You just did a new coordination. Turn the power on, and all your transmitters find where they're supposed to live. Um, so it's incredibly efficient, incredibly fast. I just scanned, did a coordination, uh, and deployed frequencies for uh, X number of channels. In moments. That was amazing. Yeah. That's it. That's got to make you feel good, doesn't it, Wit? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, looking forward to that very much. So, yeah, uh, when we uh, when we yeah. go to work on the next project that's coming up shortly. Very good, Kevin. How does that type of workflow help you as a boom operator? 
Well, definitely in the morning, you know, it's, if it saves, you know, 15 minutes of time for me, you know, it's 15 more minutes I could be on set watching for our department. So that, that's a big, big help there. So it's just basically more of a balance. It gives back more time that you have to focus on, you know, for lack of better words, maybe the more important things that we need to be focusing on. Not that wireless interference and wireless isn't important, but, you know, we just want that to work, right? Pretty much, yeah. It, it, it's very distracting when, you know, if I need to be on the set and we're changing frequencies of something, yeah. you know, it, it, it's really, you know, it's hard enough just to get to the set most days. You know, we do a lot of shows on location and once you're there and then having to do the scan and, you know, um, with COVID now we're having to send, sometimes send off transmitters ahead of time, you know, so the actors are wiring themselves a lot lately. Sometimes, you know, very rare do we have to send the transmitter out, but we do from time to time. And then, um, but now, Actors are, you know, at least placing wires on them themselves. And then when they get to the set, you know, we're, we're placing the packs on them. So uh, it's going to be a big time saver. We have a few questions from the audience here and actually a few comments as well. Uh, Stephen Horan says, I rented an original analog Axiant system for a project a few years ago. The show link was flawless. And another person is asking, can you have sure modify the AD4Q to AD4QDC units if you didn't buy them as AD4QDC? You absolutely can. Yep, it will have to go into service. Uh, service will swap that module for you. Um, I am unsure as to price for that swap, but it is entirely doable. Copy that. So if you guys have any questions about that, why don't you just contact me directly and I will uh, flow that through Jason and we'll get that information for you. Yeah, so the, to note, you will lose the AC loop through. That's the trade off there when you get a DC module. So you won't have the loop through portion. Um, so that's that's the power supply swap. Uh, but yeah, if you bought an AC with an AC loop through version and you're looking to get a DC, we absolutely can swap the power module for you, um, or you can get a DC DC unit. What about battery life on these packs with running show link? Is the battery life shorter on your transmitter packs? So that's part of why uh, you'll notice that the ADX series are uh, proprietary rechargeables only. Um, engineering wise, we had a hard time getting what we felt was acceptable battery uh, life with double A's, um, even lithiums. So we created a line of our own batteries. So you're getting <clears throat> seven to 12 hours, depending on power output uh, is standard on all of the ADX lines from battery. Um, so, and to keep in mind that in the digital domain, lower power, it, it's not exactly the same in, in terms of, you know, a two milliwatt transmitter in digital is is a whole lot of RF power uh, and it scares people. But a 10 milliwatt is akin to <clears throat> at least 50, if not more, in the analog realm. So, you know, don't be afraid to power down your outputs on these transmitters if, you, if you've got great RF signal and your, R, and your battery life is going to increase exponentially that way. Excellent. Um, mm -hmm. Another question. He, oh, just a lot of people saying that sure lithium batteries are rock solid. Why don't you talk a little bit more about the battery power that you guys have uh, and all the rechargeable aspects of things that you have, Jason? And Jason, can you come back on your screen just so we're not seeing your computer for a while? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. I forgot that that was, uh, that was there. We miss you. Welcome back, everybody. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so rechargeable batteries. We make a, a, a ton of them. Um, there's, I don't even know how many we have now, but we make rechargeables for a lot of things. Um, so this, the first one that we came out with and kind of the most popular is the SB900. Um, it's kind of this module here. It looks like almost like two double A's in a package. Um, and this is what we use for um, the AD1, our PSM1000, P10R body pack. Um, we make a lot of body packs that kind of look like this, uh, which is ULXD, AD1, PSM1000, P9, P10. Um, and the SB900 is somewhat universal in that way that it fits uh, all of those form factors. Um, following that is the ADX1M battery, which we saw earlier, this, this very thin sliver uh, of a piece that fits in the back of the pebble, as I like to call it. Um, and then the body pack and the handheld for ADX, this is the handheld version. Um, so it's kind of one long skinny stick uh, and the body pack is 
more of a small square um, here. So uh, again, the ADX1 and the ADX2 um, have charging contacts. So you can kind of see these metal contacts here if you can. If you can, that's on the hand mic. Um, I don't have an ADX1 with me. All of them are on loaner. Um, but those have charging contacts because they will fit into some, some docking chargers with the battery in the belt pack or in the hand mic itself. This is more of an install thing that you'll see in permanent installs. Um, it may work for some of your workflows. Um, for your workflows, we've got a, a abundance of charging options. So there are rack mount chargers, which I have in the rack behind me at the very bottom. It might be difficult to see. I believe there was uh, one at the true office as well. The rack mount charger will do eight batteries uh, per one RU, um, and every two batteries is a different module. So you can get a, a two battery module for the SB900, a two battery module for the body pack, a two battery module for the hand mic, and you can kind of mix and match. And those modules will come in and out. So you can um, you know, build as you'd like. Outside of that, there are uh, quite a few just battery chargers that are flat and use a DC power supply that would fit inside of a drawer or uh, a rack. And those do uh, average eight batteries per unit. Um, so you could get eight micro, an eight, an eight port micro charger or an eight port ADX1, ADX2 charger um, that would do eight batteries with one power supply. Um, and then earlier, I kind of touched on the chips that we put in there, right? So we've got we've got some pretty solid information that you can get. Um, and I guess uh, I'll pull up the screen share again here, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, for sure. To, to show the, t the telemetry information you get from chargers um, as well. So if I if I were to come down here and, and pull up my my battery charger in my monitor tab of Wireless Workbench. Uh, in this version, you can kind of see some basic information of the eight slots, how far along the charging is in percentage, right? But if I were to open this up a little bit larger, um, now I can actually see my charge at 71%, 100%, 64 My next option is health. All these batteries are at 100%. I've taken good care of them. Um, I've, I've put them through the right cycle and made sure they were charged. This is how many cycles. Um, and so a cycle is considered a full zero to a full 100. So if you use 20% of the battery and then charge it again, and then use 10% of the battery and charge it again, you've really only used 30% of a cycle. So until you do a full 100% drain over multiple uses, that's where we get this cycle count from, right? So it's a true representation of a full depletion and a full charge over time. Um, and then current temperature, right, of the, of the specific battery, which will affect lithium ion as we know. Um, but all of this stuff uh, is, is pretty important and give, it will change as we move along uh, throughout use case. A lot of times you'll see um, some batteries actually get better um, in terms of their milliamp. So if I open one specific battery on the right, um, original here was 2200 milliamps. My current max is 2228, uh, which means that over time this chip has figured out how to maximize some of the milliamps inside of here to increase its performance. So it's really doing some awesome things in there. Uh, and we spent a lot of time on making sure uh, you guys would trust our rechargeables because it was the only option we had for that ADX line to get you the battery life. And if the rechargeable wasn't trustworthy, then the whole product wasn't trustworthy. So um, we're pretty proud of them. Amazing. Guys, I actually have a new guest for you guys. Please help me welcome Glenn True. Glenn, say hello to everyone. Uh-oh, Glenn, I'm not hearing you. Make sure that you're unmuted on your end. We had to have him muted in the beginning. Uh, how, about, how about now? There we go. We got you now, sir. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Good. Um, yeah, glad to, glad to join everybody. Say hi. Uh, yeah, I've been, been watching this, and uh, it's, it's an amazing system. Um, I was there with Jason and Kevin and, and Witt in Atlanta uh, two weeks ago and saw, saw the, the digital system for the first time in action. And I uh, just want to let everybody kind of know what I saw and what impressed me. Um, first of all, the, 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 the micro transmitter, what I believe you went with the micro transmitter, is that right? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, for, uh, it, it was, for it's a mixture, but, oh, but no. mainly, mainly, mainly 12 of those, I think is what we went with. Yep. Right. One thing real appealing about the micro transmitter
sometimes it pokes the actors if, if uh, you're hiding it on them. But without the antenna, I was really wondering what its performance would be like. And it was the, the, the walk test we did with both types of transmitters, one with and without the, the antenna, seemed like it was at least 95% of, of the one with the external antenna. And usually it was just, you couldn't tell the difference. Um, and the, the people in Atlanta have probably all been to the showroom there in Atlanta, so they, they understand the situation, but I'll describe it, which is the, the, the system was set up in the back of the, of the building where we have open for events. And then it's another 100 feet to get from there to the front door of a brick and steel building. Uh, so the walk test went from, from the back where we were, out the front door, which is 100 feet, continuing across the street to the bank. There's a Wells Fargo bank that's out the front door and well across the street. With this micro uh, transmitter on our subject, uh, without a dropout. Uh, on uh, so on, uh, on little, and just, little whip antennas on the front of the rack, I might add, as right. well. Just yeah. the whip antennas screwed onto the rack. That's amazing. These are not external uh, directional antennas. Um, so that, that was good under any circumstances, but a, a tiny transmitter like that uh, with no external antenna that still did it. So it was very impressive. Not only did, did we have audio coming from the person doing the walk test, we also had control of their transmitter from the receivers through all that. So that was uh, you know, very impressive. So just to kind of put in perspective concerns you might have about a transmitter with no external antenna. Um, and what I was curious also, and, and Kevin, um, how much of a factor was in you choosing that trans, excuse me, that transmitter, it doesn't have an antenna. Uh, was, was it, I mean, it was big. It's the, it's the shape and uh, uh, everything. It, but that was a big factor was the size of the transmitter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's actually hold, you know, really, I was concerned you know, in pictures, it looks large, but it's not. It's really teeny tiny transmitter. Yeah, it was nice to finally actually get one in our hands and study it and the whole system. And Jason, we appreciate you coming down and doing that for us. Um, yeah, absolutely. What, uh, what a, it, yeah, go ahead. Just, just for the record, if anybody else wants to set up a, a demo of this stuff, please, please reach out. We'd be more than happy to do it for anybody here. Um, and show you some stuff in person uh, when, when, and when, and if comfortable and able. Yeah, we have locations all over the place, so all of us have access to this gear. All you need to do is give us a call. We'd be happy to set up a personal demonstration for you to make sure that you get it working beautifully. Mm -hmm. You know, we have and a just one more thing to touch on, uh, real quick. The uh, if you haven't already, and I'm, I might have missed it if if I did, just let me know. But as I recall, uh, in lieu of a, uh, in, instead of a, uh, an RF signal strength indicator, there's a quality uh, indicator on the, on the rack. Is that right? Would, would you explain why that choice was made? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we briefly touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, uh, the quality meter, again, is, is, not, is not specific to Sure. There's a lot of manufacturers that make digital wireless that have it. Uh, and, I, and just educating people to understand what what the meaning behind it is is pretty important because for for really ever people lived and died by the RSSI meter and and what that meant from an RF level and now that is while it is important to have a, a good received single strength the the reality is is that you can have much less signal and still get a good quality reception of a digital transmitter and so Q is quality. And it, sta and it really is a representation of the input of both your A and B antennas um, and the uh, ones and zeros coming in from both of those antennas. Um, and then kind of cross-referenced cross on uh, those two packets to say, hey, are these both the same? Are we missing any packets? What's the quality of my packet information and how much packet loss do I have? Um, and that's really a, kind of another important distinction to understand about Axiant Digital specifically is that we are truly taking the input from antenna A and the input from antenna B, uh, looking at both of those packets, and then actually making a sum of those two packets where we take some packets from A and some packets from B based on health and give you the output uh, to give you the highest quality Q meter possible. 
Um, and so that that's what the Q meter is. If you you can see it in a lot of ways um, in Workbench and on the front of the rack. Um, if you want to pull up my uh, the front of the rack here. Um, you can see there's on the actual LCD screen, um, there's five bars on the front or, or four, five dots, excuse me, that are white uh, next to the name. And that's the Q meter in that screen layout. Um, there's a couple different screen layouts on the front um, that it's going to be hard for you to see. I think I can't tell how big it is, but on this and this one, there's a little box that says Q5 uh, next to the show link light. Um, the white box next to your battery time you can see that it's actually giving you four hours and five minutes seven hours and 40 minutes like we mentioned um uh, and then if i were to scroll right here you can see there's a couple different ways to look at this front menu so there's your five dots of q in a dot mode um and so there's a couple different ways to set up this front menu for for what you want to view and how you want to see it and then in workbench um it shows up as as uh the color purple either in dots or a line um, if, if we're, there's a good segue there to talk about quadversity, which we didn't do a lot of in Atlanta and, uh, quadversity is a proprietary sure option, um, that comes on the quad receiver of sure Axion digital and quadversity takes the cascade outputs of your, um, your receiver. So you've got your A and your B inputs. Uh, and then normally the, the two antenna outputs below that are your cascade outputs. It actually makes those inputs and they're labeled as C and D um, on, the, on the receiver. So you lose your cascade functionality, but essentially it gives you the opportunity to put four antennas up for a receiver. Uh, and I mentioned a minute ago how we're taking specific packets from each antenna and then comparing and contrasting and then building one output. So quadversity really, it's you couldn't even say it doubles your your strength. It's almost exponential in how much better it gets because now you've got four specific inputs in your one zone um, to really give you a robust signal. This is deployed at the Super Bowl and was in Tampa Bay, right, for halftime. And like every single mic is on quadversity at that point so that they get four antennas and it's you're getting an individual data stream from each antenna. Um, which is very unique to digital wireless and very unique to Axiom Digital. Um, so just, just another way to increase. You absolutely could do a second zone as well. So you, didn't have, you don't have to put all four antennas in one zone. You do massively increase your reliability in one zone. But if you needed to take C and D antennas and run them to a different space, it would give you two zones on one receiver of receive. We've got a couple of questions from the audience too. Um, uh, a lot of production sound mixers, all production sound mixers, will be glad to see that you have a four-pin XLR for DC power on the receiver rack. We do. Yep. Absolutely. I think there's only one component. Uh, was the show link that requires AC? Yeah, the spectrum manager unit uh, is not a DC powered unit at this time. Um, and uh, so we don't we don't have an answer there quite yet. So this the spectrum manager, the Axion 600. Uh, will require AC power um, for that to function. I forget what the actual current draw is, but I think it's low enough where a small inverter would take care of that. And we have seen it run on quite a few inverters over time. Um, I don't mm -hmm. know the specific current draw off the top of my head either, but it's not uncommon to see it run on an inverter. Yeah. And the questions we, we get every single time, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it. And you can answer Shoot. it uh, how you choose. Uh, what, what about a um, – so, so many of our customers work out of a bag doing reality documentaries uh, and running gun yep. type productions. Yep. Uh, they all want the system. They want to have, be able to use it. So what about a, a portable bag size receiver? We, uh, we, we want you to have the system. We are aware that there's a requirement for uh, a different form factor for this product. Um, and, you know, sure is always working on new and exciting things. We did, we did touch this early on, but I'm happy to touch oh, it yeah. again. It's not, it's not falling on deaf ears. It's not something we aren't aware of. Uh, so yeah, just we're always working on new and exciting things here at Sure. Absolutely. Guys, okay. we have a, a couple questions from the audience here. Uh, one of them is, is the RSSI measured as a percentage or a DBM? It's measured as a DBM. Copy. Um, and so if you notice on, uh, I can't, well, yeah, I can show you on my screen share as well. Um, if I pull up Workbench here one more time. You want the gear or your screen share? I'm going to do my screen share here. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Of course, something about screen sharing this just 
makes my network a little grumpy. I'll have to figure that out. Um, but you'll notice here, if you can see on the left, you'll see overload, neg 70, 75, 80, 85, 90 um, from, the, from the orange lights on the front. And those are actually what those correspond to. So neg 70, 75, 80, 85, and neg 90 um, at the bottom. And then uh, if you were to continue on to some, some further locations, you could open things like timeline, um, which is a function of wireless workbench that basically gives you a time stamp of um, a timestamp history of everything that's happened in your rack. Um, so if I were to select the two channels that I'm using and hit record, let's see if this is going to function. So there we go. You should be able to now see. Looks like there's some lag. I'm, I'm looking at the, the fold back here. There we go. Um, so timeline, timestamps, um, and records, uh, everything that's happening with your rack uh, and your transmitters. So this is what we used when we walk test, uh, did a walk test in Atlanta. Um, and basically this function uh, pulls up the Q meter at the top. You see the big purple bar there, that's Q5. Uh, then there's the two blue lights. This is your um, link on antenna A and antenna B. Um, just below that, you've got your orange and your yellow. Uh, there is some orange underneath that yellow that you can't see. That is your RSSI on A and B uh, with the NEG 60 and NEG 120 meter on the left. Um, after that uh, is the audio. This is not actual audio. This is just a representation on a graph of your input signal as to look for uh, some spikes or cracks and pops or to make sure you're actually getting audio through your lav. Um, under that is the green bar, which is your battery life. And then at the very bottom is show link, which is the blue, how many bars or how much quality is your show link. Um, so this is a great tool to hit record uh, prior to a show or a set or a take. Um, and if you have something that you're not sure what happened audio wise, you can open it up, save the file, open it up, go to the timestamp, go, hey, it was like 3.15. Remember that? I don't know what happened. Uh, open the file, go back and look, and then it will show you, uh, you know, whether there was an RF dropout, whether your Q meter went down, whether you didn't have show link, or you, maybe you'll see a spike in the audio and, and your RF is fine. And you can go, okay, so my RF was fine, but maybe this element's got a problem in the wire, or maybe you know she just something hit the element and that's what that sound was. Uh, but it's a really good troubleshooting tool to be able to go back with a time-stamped um, output of everything your system's doing across the board. Um, and I can tell you this much, if you're having problems, this will be one of the first things we ask for from sure is, Hey, can you record a timeline and recapture what happened and send me that file? Cause this really allows me to dig into, to what's going on with your rack. So great function, a lot of information in there, and it's a very small file size. You, you can run it. Um, uh, you see in the top right here, it says I could run this for 3,000, 35,714 weeks. Uh, so don't worry about your file size. We, we did this intentionally to make sure it's very small. You can record everything your rack's doing um, and get a bunch of troubleshooting information out of that. Incredible. You know, one more quick question before we go. I have one person asking, is remote control functions available only on the hardware dials or only via software? Is the computer necessary for remote controlling the functions? Uh, computer is not necessary. Uh, no, not at all. Um, the the front panel of the receiver, uh, if you were to use the dials and the buttons on the front, will do uh, all of the same functionality. Um, I can demonstrate it if you'd like. Uh, but yeah, anything you can do on the front panel of the receiver, you can do in Workbench. Uh, it is a workflow thing. Um, and then the Channels app has quite a bit of functionality as well in terms of uh, control editing um, and monitoring from the iPad or the iPhone. Um, so we spent a lot of time on the front menus to try to make them easy to navigate of the actual unit themselves, make it simple, uh, make it flow. Um, so yeah, you can remote control, you can get a new frequency, you can take a scan. Um, you can even do a coordination on the front of the AXT 600 without workbench. Um, it's called wizard. Um, and you hit wizard and it will see what's connected, ask you if you want extra channels and take a scan and do a full coordination inside the box. Um, so for those of you that are remote on your cart and you don't want to plug a laptop in, if it's all networked in the rack, you could do a full scan, coordination, deploy, 
um, and automatic changes from the front panel of, of your rack. Absolutely. Incredible. Well, guys, I think that is going to wrap it up for today's Accent Overview. I am so thankful for everyone that joined us. Guys, if you have any questions, please remember that we have locations all around the U.S. and Canada. So if you have any questions, please contact us. We're here to help you. All of our sales reps have a ton of information on this. We've been versing ourselves on this new system to help you guys out because we think it's pretty special. And we also want to say thank you to Whit Norris and Kevin for joining us today. Thank you so much for your experience. Can we bring you back maybe after a show to talk to you a little bit more about your experiences with the unit after you really dive in? Sure. Absolutely. Sounds fun? Awesome. Well, we'll yeah. make it a date then, guys. Oh, I want to say thank you again to Jason and Glenn as well. Glenn, do you have anything that you'd like to say to end the, uh, end the show out? Um, no, I, th I think you, you, you said it very well, Thomas. Well, there we go, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sure Axiom Overview. We'll see you on the next one. we got a new show on Tuesday. We'll see you then. Take care.